Hi everyone, this is Walt Bayless with the Business and People podcast. And today I'm extremely excited to have the innovator, Carrie Zimmerman on the call with me. Carrie is an Olympic champion representing the United States in the Olympics at just 18 years of age. She now runs the biggest public relations and advertising agency in Florida, one of the top five agencies in the world and the only one in the top five not in New York City. She has 160 full-time staff and her customers include clients such as Citibank, Club Med, The Hard Rock Group, Ritz Carlton. She's a speaker. She's spoken on stage in Moscow, Singapore, London, in Cairo, in Egypt. And she is on the phone with us today to talk about her wow philosophy and her amazing journey to the position that she's at. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you. It's my pleasure. It's really great to have you. Now, Carrie, you've transitioned from being that Olympic champion to now running one of the most amazing advertising and PR agencies in the world. How did that all come together? Well, I will tell you, I would love to tell you that I originally had some kind of massive entrepreneurial spirit. I know that's not the best way to start by telling entrepreneurs you don't have to always know that you were an entrepreneur to begin with. I always knew I was a hard worker, right. I always knew I was a hard worker. Or I would not have made the Olympic team in gymnastics where there's only six spots every four years. But um, our, we, we were actually in Atlanta, right? My husband and I were working in Atlanta, and we already had our first two sons, and they were one and three, and we looked at each other one night. We traveled all the time, which is still what we do. And we thought, you know what? They need to be around family. And I was from and born and raised in Tallahassee, Florida, which isn't exactly the uh, business hub of the world. And we said, you know what, if we had to sacrifice where we went with our jobs, we would just have to, you know, be in Tallahassee so they could be around a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles. And we would try to make it work. If we had five people, then, you know, that's what it would end up being. But we had to put family first. Well, I think somewhere along the line, the competitive spirit kind of took over. Nice. Because... Obviously, you know, decades later and 160 some people, it's a little bit different story. So, but it also tells you you can do, you can be successful. And especially these days, you can be successful wherever you want to be. You don't have to be in New York City or some major city in the world to make it happen. Yeah, beautiful. Now, you, you were saying that the hard work ethic, uh, you know, developing that as one of the, the leading gymnasts in the world. Did you find that the, the I guess, the, the drive, the, the determination, the focus that it took to achieve at that level has helped you in business moving forward? Well, once again, you know, usually, usually the most direct answer is probably what's not going to come out of my mouth. Right. But, um, <laughs> but I would love to tell you it has worked for me and probably been more of an advantage, but it's also been a disadvantage because, you know, as anyone training for the Olympics, you work out, you know, 10 hours a day for many years of your life, every day, never, never get a day off. Um, and it's all about discipline and focus. And the majority of the time, your coach is telling you everything you need to do better. You know, as, as someone training to be a high level athlete, you really don't get a lot of pampering. You don't get a lot of positive. That was awesome. You get a lot of too bad. You didn't do it better. Here's a million things you can do to get you wow. where you want to go. Yeah. So the good news, well, the good news to that is that's how I ran a business, how I run a business. The bad news is I went through a lot of employees before I figured out that didn't work so well for employees. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because we would finish a presentation and I'd be like, wow, that was great. You did awesome. Now, let's do a post-mortem and go through everything you need to do better. And not in a critical way, at least in my mind. I didn't think it was a critical way. I thought, you know, that's positive to me. I want to I wanna learn. I wanna, the only thing I want to chew on is everything I could do better the next time. Well, you start realizing that, you know, not every employee is like that. Not most employees are like that. You know, they consider it criticism, no. um, not necessarily getting you to the goal. So I really had to taper back that side and realize I was not their coach. Okay. You know, I could be their mentor, but I was not their coach to the point of telling them every single little thing they needed to do better the next time. So, again, if, if I had to say which way did it balance did the discipline of being an athlete, work it to my advantage or disadvantage, it'd be to my advantage. But there were there were a lot of hiccups along the way to kind of tone it back a little bit and understand that the typical dynamics of an employee is they want to do 
a really good job and they want to really excel, um, but they don't want to be told every little thing that they need to do better. Right. I guess, well, that's, that's why Olympians are Olympians because they're at that, that elite level. Now you've run this, you've run your agency for the last 30 plus years, which I think is amazing. And talking of your team, when I was doing a little bit of research there, Carrie, what, what, one of the quotes that really stood out to me, so you've just said about not being their coach in every single aspect of whatever they're doing, but one of the quotes that, that, uh, that you've been noted as saying is that you are constantly and daily uh, awed by your team in their creativity and talent. Is that something that, that has wowed you continuously as you've built the, the Zimmerman Agency? A hundred percent, Walt. We we actually have these big, giant, they, they actually rub on letters, right, and visuals, and our creative team makes them look really good, and they're literally from floor to ceiling, all over the walls, whichever, we've got two different buildings with a giant courtyard in the middle, and it's just to remind them of different inspirational things every day, and my favorite one is that think, create, think and create at the speed of culture. Nice. Because let's remember, whatever we did yesterday is not going to be good enough tomorrow. It's just not, you know, the world changes so quickly. Um, and so another one that's up there says, you know, what have we done to make our clients say, wow, today and the today part's big. So maybe it does go back to that coaching, pushing a little bit. Sure. But in a passive <laughs> a little way, more subtly. Yep. <laughs> a little more subtly, but it does remind us that, um, you know, in today's world in marketing, you can't really rest on your laurels from what you did the day before. Definitely. Um, and again, I think a lot of times people say, wow, that was awesome. And, you know, six months later, I'll really get my act back together and come up with something fantastic. Um, and to us, we really think of it. Speed of culture means, you know, every hour, every minute, especially in a social world, um, things change dramatically. So we have to be nimble. Yeah. Um, that's another word that we use a lot. Um, not fast on our feet, be not just innovative, but that we have to be nimble because what we wake up thinking we're going to do that day and what we're starting to do five minutes after work starts um, usually drastically changes. And that means, you know, we're, we're really li living on the cusp of chaos, uh, which I truly believe in. Um, and that, that makes us better and, and work harder and, and be prouder of the work we do every day. I, I love it, Carrie, and, and I'm so conscious of your time. So uh, there's so many things I want to drill into, like why advertising and so many other different bits and pieces. I know that we've caught you between flights and, and you know, you've just literally landed less than an hour ago. We've, you're off on another flight coming soon. So I'm very conscious of your time. I'll try, and, I'll try not to dig, I'll, I'll keep you on the phone for two hours, but I, I, I'll try not to do that. So one of the things that I wanted to drill into, Carrie, was that, uh, you know, this, this speed of culture, the change at the speed of culture, I think would be something that has been really impactful as the social side of advertising and PR has come into play in the last few years. Tell me about that. Well, it's, you know, it's a fabric of our life, right? <laughs> um, it, it doesn't really matter what age, the volume and the intensity of which you use social media, you know, and are influenced, it depends on your age to some degree, but it touches everybody. It's not going anywhere. It's not going away. I think it was yep. what Al Gore or somebody said that, you know, the internet was going to be temporary. I don't know. Who it was. Yeah. I think it's going to be a big one day. Not, yeah. yeah. It's not going anywhere. Let's put it that way. So we really have to, like I said before, be on our toes and be nimble, but also be a little bit more 360 than ever before in the world of marketing. Sure. So just because you planned on doing something, um, and you do the media would cover it from a PR perspective, basically in a certain direction, something can absolutely change that direction before you've even completed executing whatever the activity happens to be, yeah. depending on if somebody socially doesn't agree with you, um, they have some clout, they're an influencer, suddenly your control is out of control. Mm. You know, there is no such thing as controlling it anymore. It doesn't yeah. exist. Um, so you have to really look at your scenarios. What are your options? You know, kind of what are your risk rewards and, and, you know, be as careful as you can still be fearless, be as careful as you can in planning so that you can look at it comprehensively and know that something as small as nothing um, can really throw you off against whatever your strategy happened to be. Right. And, and be able, and as you said a, a few times, be nimble, be able to change. Is that something that, um, obviously you're, you're bringing that culture, that, that nimbleness into the Zimmerman agency. How do you, how do you facilitate that at a, at a boardroom level where you're talking to a client and something's got to change? How does that, how's you, how do you and your team uh, work that kind of change of direction on an ongoing basis? 
Well, I'll, I'll give you a, I, I, and I don't think they'll mind since we just had them on NBC, CNBC, CBS, all the, all the American news channels yesterday. Fantastic. But I'll give you a perfect example. So we handle hard rock worldwide, right? Mm -hmm. Hard rock hotels and resorts, not the cafe side, but the gambling, entertainment, and hotel side. Yep. Um, they are opening tomorrow. Their largest, wait, what's today? What is today? Tuesday. So they're opening Thursday. They're really most, what they believe will be their iconic property in the world, even though they have ones in Macau and Malaysia and China and everywhere else you can think of. And it happens to be in a little place called Hollywood, Florida. Nice. Between Miami and Fort Lauderdale in Florida. And so it's in the middle of nowhere. It's been a very successful resort, but they just spent $1.5 billion as an addition, if you can imagine. Wow. So, yes, on an already extremely large resort, a 1.5 billion. So everything has been about ramping up for this week. It is built like a guitar going up to the sky. Wow. So the building is actually vertical and the whole thing lights up and it's the body of a guitar. So you can see it from airplanes. You can see it from everywhere. We've worked on this for a year. This is opening week wow. coming up in two days, but all week long. So what happens and all the media um, for business news is set up for Monday and Tuesday of this week in New York, they hit all the business news. So what happens last week, a property they were building in New Orleans collapses and three people die. Wow. So here we are, right? Here we are. What has been planned for a year to be the most grand opening of all times in a different market um, in still a Southern market you know, and not even across the United States, yeah. um, you have something horrible happen yeah. um, and it causes death. And, you know, we immediately had to decide, what do we do? Do we push back opening? Do we move everything? You know, what you, you have to look at the families, you have to look at the community, um, lives have been lost. Um, you can't just frivolously be doing all this happy, happy guitar smashing, which is part of the <laughs> opening that's iconic to hard rock. Um, and so, you know, at that point, we really created two different teams. Again, to be nimble, instead of the teams that were already in place, we did a, brought in a whole separate team that was our crisis team, but it was a different kind of crisis team that we're accustomed to. It was a crisis team that had to convert quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, whereas usually you have, you know, a, a while to heal wounds and do everything else. We could not. The, the size and the magnitude of this opening this week was just too big to move. Wow. So it was like, how do you pay? Um, you know, pay attention to the needs of the disaster in New Orleans and how do you continue to take care of the 19,000 employees that will be working at the Hard Rock Hotel in Hollywood. Wow. You know, everybody has something at stake. So um, it was quite interesting. Um, it takes fearless clients. It takes clients that will listen to you and listen to your advice and understand that it's sound. Um, we ran the diag diagnostics across everything. And understood that by moving forward, they may not, you know, some people might look at it as being, you know, a little bit egregious um, and greedy. Let's go ahead and make it happen. But on the other hand, if you do it well, um, that isn't going to happen. So as of Monday and Tuesday that just closed out, all the business news included it in all of Jim Allen, the CEO's interviews. But they pivoted well and spent 75%, if not 80 or 85% of their interviews talking about Hollywood and the global growth of hard rock. Fantastic. They felt comfortable with that. We gave them the ammunition to feel very comfortable with the transition between a disaster to a celebration. Um, and it took us being fast on our feet and having clients that believe, you know, quite honestly, because most clients would say, there's no way I'm going to go in front of Neil Cavuto and let him rip me apart. Yeah. Um, about moving forward with an opening. So I think that's a really perfect example that you've got to be so quick on your feet because Definitely. things change. We then we had a social team monitoring every single news outlet as we were doing it to see wow. what the sentiment was. You know, how was the sentiment range um, when he was talking about the disaster and then even the, the interviewer would have to kind of do a shift to a positive message. And truthfully, there was no, there were no negative pushbacks People understood there were, there were people's lives and welfare at stake in both instances. Mm. You put off for a month and have 19,000 people not be employed. Yeah. Um, so um, I think the messaging was strong. The strategy was strong. 
But again, it takes clients to be somewhat fearless to say, I believe and I trust you, and then have place, things in place to monitor social media to make sure it's going in the direction we wanted. Sorry, right. that was a little bit of a long story. No, but I, I love it, Carrie. I love no. it. And I, I, think, <laughs> I think as I'm listening, like I'm, what my goal of the podcast is obviously people in their cars, they're listening on, you know, on the way to work, away home, something, they're filling in that little spot in their lives, they're on the treadmill, wherever. And you know, this entrepreneurial drive that we all have, to, to be able to hear that kind of story coming back from you, Carrie, where, where we might be looking at a scenario in our own businesses and we say, well, I, I need to deal with this a little bit quicker. To understand that a, a, a tragedy that's happened to, uh, at the scale that it happened in New Orleans and being able to then manage that into a, a positive spin of the biggest you know, launch of this brand in the world, like it, it really helps to understand that there are ways and means of overcoming like whatever seems to be even the most tragic circumstances. Well, I, I agree. And so we have, everybody should, um, I'm not really sure when this is going to air, so I won't really make it as timely. But um, if, it, if it's posted, everybody needs to Google and look for an amazing picture with fireworks shooting out of it come Thursday night. And Carrie's smiling face on the side. Carrie, now this, the, the story with the Hard Rock Group, you know, managing the hotels and resorts, amazing, amazing client to have. I'm sure they were not the same caliber as your first venture into this space, into advertising and PR. How did you get started in that area? Well, I, I will be honest with you. It actually, we, we decided, and I, when I referenced we, my, my husband Curtis and I co-founded the company. So yeah. I want to I wanna make sure that, that, that that's clear. Um, when we decided to move to Little Tallahassee, Florida, we decided we did not want to do, you know, the local car dealerships and, you know, the local tennis tournament and nothing yeah. wrong with that. But that if we started down that row um, in that direction, we would, we would get so caught up in just doing little one-offs all the time, we would never be able to grow the way we wanted to grow. So we were very fortunate in that, you know, we had already had eight or so years in our careers. Um, and so we really said, we're going to stick to only trying to do dynamic brands that fit with who we believe our brand is. Wow. So um, unfortunately, it was a little bit of a, I mean, unfortunately, your story doesn't prove out on this one because it was a bit of a fairy tale. But by the first six months, um, we were the national PR firm for Marriott Worldwide. We were the national PR firm for Domino's Pizza and City Corp Diners Club. So yeah. um, it, it, was, it was really just using connections that we had in the past. Um, we didn't take purposely any business at all from the agency where we had been. That was really important to us. Yeah. We didn't want to look back after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and when somebody said, how did you start? Say it was kind of like how Mad Men used to work on right. TV was very true. You, you snuck out in the middle of the night and you stole clients, right? <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of how the advertising and PR world worked for years and years and years and yep. still does to some degree. We wanted to have great integrity and never have to say we stole a client from our former employees. I yes. mean, our former bosses who yep. are dear friends of ours to this day. So we're, we're right. as proud of that, that we were able to really begin as entrepreneurs um, and do it from scratch. But I will, I will tell you, it's funny, the guy, we had worked with a guy at Domino's Pizza who had, unbeknownst to us, gone to uh, the headquarters up north, and he was like, oh, I heard you started your own firm, hop on a plane and fly up and let's talk. Well, I'm not going to name the gentleman, but he did like to party, and we were like, what are we going to do? We don't have a dime, and he wants us to fly up there in Michigan and come party, and A, I'm not a big partier, and B, we didn't have enough money for plane tickets, right? right. And we thought wants to have fun and everything else. So this conversation goes on for months and we keep kind of ignoring him, which is crazy because we had just started the company. And finally he calls us and he's like, are y'all crazy? He said, you do know I'm fourth in line to be the CEO at Domino's Pizza Worldwide. <laughs> and so we were like, we'll be there next week. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for the extra push. Yeah, we were like, wow, we thought he was still a regional, which there's nothing wrong with regional, but you yeah. know, we thought he was still a regional and that that is not really where we wanted to be. And instead, he, we walked in the building and he took us to Tom Monahan's office and the CEO who also or, um, started Domino's Pizza and owned different sports, to pro sports teams, and it just hosted the Pope. Um, and we nice. spent two hours with Tom Monahan and walked out with a contract. So, wow, fantastic. Um, after, after we blew him off for three or four months, 
I love it. And, and the, how's, the, how's, your pos, how's your posture when you're able to say, look, you know, hey, Domino's, I'll come back to you when I'm ready. Like that's, that's an amazing starting point. Even, even though it wasn't deliberate, you've, you've got that ability to say, hey, guys, we're too busy. We, we'll come and talk to you when we're ready. Exactly. So we, we, have been, we have been very fortunate that for the first, you know, but within the first year, we already were handling as the agency of record not just for the region, but for the nation, um, you know, full brands. So we kind of stuck with that. So anytime somebody asked us to do things that we didn't feel felt, our, felt our, uh, worked within our brand, if we didn't feel that we'd get our people excited, if it was a brand we didn't believe in, we didn't work with them. Nice. And that's a hard decision, again, as a startup and as an entrepreneur, not to take every morsel that you can get. Yeah. But I think by being selective, you end up being true to who you are. And I think, you know, it works a lot better that way. Absolutely. And I feel like you, you have a lot better, you, you used the word integrity when you were getting started with not, with not taking any clients from a previous agency. And, and because you've chosen a specific, I guess, customer sector or, or, or alignment, that integrity has been able to, to build the Zimmerman agency to what it is today. I would, I would 100% agree with that. Yeah. I think another you know, thing is we, as we talk, Walt, I, and it's really interesting when it's visual because there's a, there's a big screen that comes up and it's all black and everything else is because I'm very into color and very colorful and flashy. Um, and, and the type comes up, big type comes up and it says a giant capital F. Um, <clears throat> and then three like little asterisks, big asterisks. And I talk about the F word, the four letter F word. I've, I've read about this. And, and, of course, and uh, I, can, I, I always kind of look out of my eye and I see whoever asked me to come speak, have a smite, small heart attack, <laughs> depending on who the company is. And, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I knew she was kind of out there. But, you know, is she out of her mind? And I spend a little time talking about, you know, a four letter F word. And that we don't, we never allowed our three sons to use it. And we try not to use it. It slips out every once in a while, but you know, now, we try not to use it. And, and, and there I, should be the mentality in our company that, you know, speaking and using the F word is unacceptable. And then the rest of the screen comes up and it says fine. Exactly. The four letter F word that you absolutely abhor is the word fine. Tell me about that. Well, I just, I go back to athletic roots again, right? Sure. And I can't imagine that I was working out 10 hours a day so that I could be done for the day and somebody say, how did workout go? And they say, well, it was fine. It was fine. You know, well, what were you trying to accomplish that day? You know, I just really wanted my goal to be fine. You know, yeah. that's, that's what I wanted to achieve is to be fine. So our thought is if somebody even gets off with something as minor as a conference call, you know, where you're not even presenting anything ma massive. You're just doing your weekly conference call or whatever. And you say, how did it go? And they say, fine. I feel like we've done something wrong. Yeah. Nobody, nobody yeah, because, should be working towards a status of fine. Correct. And nobody's paying us to be fine. Yeah. Nobody's paying us to feel fine about their campaign. Nobody is really paying us to feel fine about the results. Um, and so fine is really should not be an indicator, but people use it in the regular vernacular day in and day out, right? Yeah. If you ask me, how was your day today? And they're like, fine. Yeah. And I'm like, y'all, fine. You woke up, your eyes opened, you could walk, you could breathe, you could think, you know, why in the world do you think your day is fine? You know, what, what barometer did you start it? Did you start it so low that you worked <laughs> up to fine? Or can you make fine like your balance point and you go beyond that? And I'm a big believer in that. And I think that's a, that's a, a small test word um, that, you know, everybody, when they get in their car to leave for the day, it's like, how was your day? Was it fine? You know, was it extraordinary? Was it awesome? Um, did you wow anybody? I mean, if it was just fine, every once in a while you need that. You know, you're doing your reports or you're working on your budget or whatever. You don't want to get too creative when you're working on your budget. But um, <laughs> no creativity when you're on your budget. But um, the fact of the matter is you should use that as a litmus test every, litmus test every day is did you create something that was fine or something that was extraordinary and do you feel fine about it or do you feel kind of pumped up and excited about it? And the opposite word that you have within the Zimmerman agency is I guess the word wow, which is everywhere in your company, in your buildings. So we've got the, the, the opposite sides of the poles. Is that kind of, is that what you speak about when you're going, you know, stage to stage, world to world? Are you, are you talking about we're not fine, we're wow? Is that, is that your message? 
<laughs> Probably. <laughs> no, I'm laughing because um, I just believe in it. And it's funny because we have said that literally for 30 years. And now you'll see, it started about five years ago, you see a lot of other companies, brands, not, not agencies necessarily, but companies saying, wow, you know, and that's become part of their mantra. And yeah. it's always been part of our mantra. You know, we really want to connect. We have to connect with our clients first. Before we can connect with our customers and our consumers, our clients have to be, we have to have tremendous synergy with our clients. Um, because if we don't have synergy with our clients, that doesn't mean we all agree on everything right off the bat. In fact, you know, being disruptive and being disruptive with each other is actually a very positive thing. But once we've got a strategy, there should just be this bubble of energy and enthusiasm that we're so excited to share whatever the messaging in the campaign is because it's going to wow them. Yep. And it might wow them even on a, a small level by, you know, getting a stain out. You know, it might wow them because it tastes good. It might wow them because it helps them to a better level of health. You know, wow isn't necessarily always a happy, happy word. But it always is, if we look at it on the consumer side and the customer side, it's, did they say, wow, this brand lived up to what they said they were going to do. Fantastic. And you know, so much better than um, And a lot of times they don't. But I also say that wow needs to be internal also. You mm -hmm. know, did you, did you hit your budget? You know, you might have had a $10 million budget and the client kept changing everything and you had to keep lifting and shifting and you were worried that you would not be able to come in on the budget that had been agreed on because things changed so drastically, which happens. Mm -hmm. um, but if it means at the end of the day, the balance sheet came out perfectly right, that's wild too. That is indeed. So again, it's not always, you know, rainbows, lollipops, and fireworks. You know, wow is not always that kind of wow. It's also, wow, I accomplished what I set out to do and did it in a grand way and feel wonderful about it. I love it. And I can, I can hear, I can feel why your, your staff are attracted to you, Carrie, because I think that message is absolutely phenomenal. Can I just ask, I, again, I'm so conscious of your time and thank you so much for, for giving up a, a valuable portion of it. Um, when, you, if, when you look at where you are now, right now with, with the Zimmerman Agency, with the amazing achievements that you've been able to put together, what lessons would you give yourself 20 years ago when you were just kind of reasonably new in the space about how you would succeed and, and some of the things that you've learned along the way? I think the biggest, I, honestly, I think the biggest thing that I've learned along the way is to remember that ultimately your team has to come before anyone else, period. It has to come before clients. It has to come before revenue. Um, you know, the team itself has to be happy. The team itself has to be excited and energized that they're doing the right thing. Um, they have to be empowered. And, you know, truthfully, I hate that word. I think it's overused and it came out of my mouth because everybody can understand it, right? Sure. Um, they have to feel like they are the ones that, that ultimately are responsible and they are the ones that get also the praise when it, when it works and it's yep. fantastic. Um, I, I love to flip, a, again, I'm, I'm big into disruption and living on the cusp of kind of chaos. And one of the things I really believe in is like, okay, in the United States, there's these, I think they're awful. Sorry if you've had the person on that creates these, but they're like all these raw, raw posters that you can put in your kitchens and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, another one. You know, it's like the guy rowing in the mist and all that kind of stuff. And I don't even, I don't even understand any of it. But um, there's one that always says there's no I in team. Mm -hmm. and, um, but there's two in Martini. I, yeah. is, that, is that what it is? Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> there's a line from a comedy skit. There's no, there's no I in team, but there's two in Martini. But, but well, well, what I'm going to say isn't nearly as clever or funny as that. But um, I, I believe that people even 20 years ago started you know, creating like Delta. It's like, welcome your Delta team on air onboard team, you know, and everything's about team and team and team. And I am a big team believer, yeah. but the team will a hundred percent not succeed if I is at the first thing that is part of team. Right. Because I think people get complacent. Mm. Um, it's kind of like, do you remember in school, I always, always had a heart attack when they said, now we're going to work as a team. And I'm like, Oh my God, yeah. I know what that means. It means me and somebody else is going to do all the work. We're going to come up with all the ideas. We're going to beg people to do what they're supposed to do. And then we're going to end up doing everything at the end of the day. And everybody else is going to get an A because we're going to really excel at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but there's yep. going to be five people that really didn't contribute. You know, we tell them their job is to bring the snacks when we're having a meeting because that was like all they were capable of. Right. So 
Um, but sometimes I think that can happen as a team. Mm. So I think I have to come long before the word team, and there really has to be an I in team, although it doesn't doesn't write out that way. Because if you don't have if you don't have people that have their own level of intensity, their own levels of intelligence and innovation and imagination and inspiration and integrity. In other words, they don't care as much. They don't want to own it because they're dependent, so dependent on the team making it happen that the team won't be successful. Um, you know, again, not, not every country in the world understands baseball. A lot of people in the United States don't understand baseball, but the guy that's standing at bat has to hit the ball. There is no the other way around it. No matter what the rest of the team does, that's his job. Right. <laughs> the pitcher has to pitch the ball down the middle or strike right. the guy out. doesn't matter what else is going on with the team. The pitcher has to make it happen. The guy at bat has to make it happen. The guy, if the ball goes in the outfield against the back wall, has to make it happen. At that point, it is about the individual that has to do their job. Right. Absolutely. So I think we got this weird complacency when we started this big, you know, somebody got on a big team, team, team push, which I'm all about team. But you have to have I first, because if the individuals don't produce, the team will never be successful. And period. that can be that can be your poster, Carrie. So so there is no I in team. But the five things that you listed and please help me with the with the memory. But it was integrity, inspiration. Uh, what were the others we had? Um, I've got to think of it off the top of my head. Um, intensity and integrity, intelligence, innovation, imagination, inspiration. <laughs> so there is no it's, I in team, but the damn that, better be all of those other things. Right. If you don't have those, you're not contributing to the team. I love it. So once again, you'll have a team where two people are pulling you along, rowing that boat through the fog or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and instead of... If you did it alone, are you working as hard as you did when you did it as a team? Because if wow. so, it will be combustible. It will be fantastic. Um, but if you just get lazy and rely on somebody else to contribute um, and you pull back, ultimately, the team will not succeed. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Now, Carrie, I, I've got just two more questions for you, if you don't mind. You're living on the edge of chaos, no, which I perfect. absolutely love. I love that, uh, that sense of living on the edge of chaos. So my first question to you is on the dark side. The, the question is, if you lost everything, if, if something happened and, and we, we woke up tomorrow morning and went, oh my God, I have to start again. What would you do if you had to start again? How would you get back to where you are? Gosh, I hate that question. Terrible question. <laughs> okay, so flip it. I will give you the first flip it response. Got which it. It's actually true. Um, we sold the company to Omnicom about 10 years ago, even though we still run it and we, mm -hmm. we don't have to. Um, so I can go buy four or five islands and never work again. So the true answer would be that. Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. But I know that's not what you're looking for. But my first answer was like, I'm good. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, sweet. Okay. <laughs> but on the realistic side is, um, I think, it, what was the question again? I mean, if you honestly, had to start again, what would you do to get, to get that punch, to get that success going? I will tell you, we would do what we do after every presentation, every big meeting, and we'd, we'd really have that serious post-mortem again and say, you know what, this is actually a positive thing. You yeah. know, we've learned a lot. We've learned along the way. Again, I learned people couldn't be coached with the intensity of being an Olympic athlete. You know, I learned that you've got to stroke them a lot more than direct them, yeah. um, give them more power, give them more things. We would analyze every, you know, don't even don't even pretend to take a client that doesn't fit with who you are mm -hmm. because it becomes destructive. When you can tell a client is not, after the fact, is not a good fit. Um, and, and I mean, you've tried everything. It is better to lose the client than it is to lose the employee. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we would really come up with just like anything else. What are all the pros and cons and where have we most success, been most successful and where have we most failed? And there's just a handful of them there. And, and you know, it would actually be a thing of beauty um, to do it because then, you know, you don't you don't get stuck with some of the baggage that you have, you know, yep. when, when you can start fresh and new. Um, I, and I, I love the fact that you turn that into a positive and say, you know what, it'll be fresh, it'll be new, it'll be a challenge, let's go. And you can, I can hear you going, all right, game on, let's, let's get this done. You know, I right. can hear it in your voice. It is. It is. It's like it. game on. Because, game on. Absolutely. Um, you know, the world has changed. And so we're, we're in an industry, well, most industries, all industries, um, you know, they could either stay where they were or, or continue to evolve. Right. 
And especially in marketing, I think every, every company in every kind of industry would say they had to greatly involve, but in marketing, when it has changed so dramatically and changes so dramatically every day, um, being part of a revolution or and or evolution is something we have to be a part of every day. Love so it. Uh, it would really give you a chance to say, do we really need a production department anymore? You know, people are, we need a smaller production department so we can put more people in social. I mean, it allows you to do the things that we've had to calibrate naturally in an evolving way over the years. But if you started from scratch, you would start with that to begin with. Every field gets sown with the seeds of knowledge from before. I love it, Carrie. And my last question for you, and again, thank you so much. My last question for you is, in addition to buying four or five islands and, and uh, enjoying those <laughs> sunsets for the rest of your life, what's, what are you working on? What's, what's the big goal? Where will we see you, the Zimmerman Agency? Like, what are you heading for? In a, uh, you mean tomorrow or a really broad term? No, in really broad terms. Like, what's, what's on the horizon for you that you just can't wait to get into? I was, I was just kidding, actually. Because the islands, are, what are they? They're settling tomorrow. You've got the closing, uh, you know, going through tomorrow from escrow. And, you know, so tomorrow's the big day, right? But <laughs> Exactly. Um, no, again, I was just kidding. Yeah. I think the main thing is, um, it is it, just, just going back to gymnastics for a minute, right? Sure. And going back, I've, I've done a lot of things with United Nations about, like, going from the balance beam to the, ball, to the boardroom, you know, which is always their clever way that they introduced me, which is lovely, but, you know, kind of funny. But, um, but, but the fact of the matter is, it's exciting. You know, every day that is in marketing, it's exciting because going back to the speed of culture, going back to this sense of intensity, going back to what you did yesterday will not work tomorrow. Um, I find that very exciting. You know, there's, there's people that are set for certain jobs that they can clock in, clock out, and nothing changes very much. And there's God, God bless them because we need all those people to run the world, right? Sure. Um, and then there's the crazy ones, you know, the crazy ones that, that want to wake up every day with their stomach kind of in a knot going, oh my gosh, you know, again, back on that kind of edge of chaos. And I'm one of those. So the long term is that everything will continue to change our interaction with other countries will continue to change because the dynamics of the countries have changed. Diversity has changed greatly. Inclusiveness has changed greatly. All of those things affect brands and we represent brands. So understanding where the dynamics are going in the world, where our cultures are going, how our, how our world is getting smaller, but it's also getting bigger, um, really is fun because it's a challenge. Um, it keeps you excited, keeps you energized, and it keeps you on your toes because nobody knows what the answer is going to be, but you want to be one of the first ones to find that answer. Wow. Fantastic, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I'm going to go back through this recording myself because I've absolutely loved it. Carrie Zimmerman, from the, from the balance beam to the boardroom, what a terrible, terrible analogy. A living on the edge of chaos, I'm going to say, is a much better one. Running the Zimmerman Agency and directing brands globally. Thank you so much for your time. I've really absolutely enjoyed it. And I can't wish you anything more than those five islands and a whole bunch of challenges to come. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And great podcast. I've gone back and listened to a lot of them. You do a wonderful job. Congratulations. Thank you so much again, Carrie. All the best. All right. Bye-bye.